Cool. So welcome to the ninth meeting of the DAPS working group. And uh, I uh, will just quickly rehash. So we're, we're trying to, what we're trying to do with these working groups. So DAPS working group, we're trying to establish verified retrieval as the norm for retrieving seeds on the web and to decrease the reliance on trusted gateways and just broadly improve the experience of DAPS uh, on IPFS with better tooling, both for developers and users. And uh, you can look at the concrete goals that we've set. Um, but as always, we start with uh, a status update on the initiatives that we have. And uh, really the two main initi initiatives that we have, they're somewhat uh, intertwined are the service worker gateway. This is a new approach to doing gateways where all of the verification happens in the browser, in a service worker. And uh, the second initiative is uh, the Helia verified fetch uh, library that is being used heavily by the service worker gateway. So we're making progress on those two things in parallel. And um, I thought maybe this time we can just go over some of the progress. Um, if you have any other topics that you want to discuss, I think uh, a great thing to do is to just drop that into the agenda and then we can uh, discuss it. With that, I'm going to open up the... Yeah, I see. Is that you, Lytle? Yeah, okay. Great. So I'm going to open up this uh, issue. We've created this uh, epic issue, which links to a bunch of sub-issues, and maybe we can go over in some of the more recent... Uh, uh, pull requests that got merged and, and some of the new functionality that we have, feel free again at any moment to drop in, pause me. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, okay. we had, uh, okay. I see that. Okay. You've dropped. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So, uh, the first thing was, uh, uh, missing support for, uh, Hamped uh, directories. Um, I'm not going to go into the technical details of that, but we've landed that. Uh, anything you want to add, Lars? You, you added it. Yeah, uh, I think like uh, th those two sound like a. They they effectively been a um, part of the same problem when you deal with very big directories, the number of blocks to enumerate and find a entity uh, find the index html in the directory takes way too long and the downloads too much for being viable in a browser and uh, we've landed optimizations down the stack so uh, like I, I mean like upstream depending where you sit and how you hold it <laughs> uh we've uh, effectively had a, a, a support for hands um, in UXFS libraries, but the, the missing part was to bubble that up to verified fetch and uh, then to the uh, service worker gateway. So when you uh, request an index HTML from a big directory or any other file, uh, it will uh, only fetch the minimal set of blocks now. Uh, and you will see that in uh, you know the, the network tab uh, based on the blocks that are fetched. Uh, and the index HTML is especially important one because that's how majority of websites work. You, you put the index HTML in a directory. So if that, if that directory happens to be a very big directory, you are in a trouble, but you are no longer in trouble. Um, yeah, details on, on linked issues. Uh, it, it took a bit, a bit longer because that would require to work across two or three repositories, but it's done now. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that the other sort of big block of work that we have here is the, uh, where is it? The support for range requests. Um, and that's a lot of the work is happening in the pull request that, uh, Russell, Russell isn't with us uh, right now, but, uh, he's really pushing forward with the support for range requests. And again, we've had, oh, we have even a fresh comment from aching brain. Um, just to like, without getting into all of the details of this, this is relevant for doing, uh, well, range requests, but uh, this is like super relevant if you're doing, say, videos, um, you're loading a video through the service worker gateway, um, 
and you basically need to map uh, HTTP range requests to the relevant blocks. And so there's this whole translation layer that is inside uh, Verify Fetch. And and I, I probably like this is, I'm going to rehash this uh, once again, but the, the whole point of Verified Fetch is to provide a very, a, an interface that is like Fetch. So um, it returns you in a response object. And this is also what makes it useful for uh, usage in a service worker. Um, so obviously the service worker gateway is one example of us using it, but uh, uh, this is Verified Fetch could be sort of implemented in your own DAP, um, in your own service worker, if you were uh, keen to do uh, things in a different way. Um, I've been working on, on, on caching and, uh, it says, I mean, it's like caches all the way down, um, just because of all the different layers of cache that are in place. Um, again, I don't think there's anything in specific right now to share unless we want to get into the details. Um, I do have a bunch of questions, Lytle, maybe, I don't know if you want to hash it, uh, out here, um, on the pull request. Um, Lytle, are you good to discuss this now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So basically the service worker cache API is the first thing that we use um, for caching. Obviously this is the pull request that introduces this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned the, sort of the importance of making a distinction between mutable and immutable responses. That seems pretty obvious. Um, I had a look at the uh, gateway spec, and according to the gateway spec, uh, we essentially you know return the cache control header uh, with immutable for all IPFS resources and anything that is under IPNS. We use uh, the uh, we set the max age based on the TTL and that's either the TTL of the DNS link record or the uh, TTL of the IPNS record. Now, the thing that's relevant here, and I sort of already commented about this is that if you're loading, say anything that is like, let's start with DNS link, right? You're loading Vitalik ETH as a subdomain gateway. Every request that goes to the, uh, to the service worker is essentially under that mutable namespace. Even though some of those resources may be immutable, you're in this situation where any of the paths that are under the IPNS colon slash slash vitalik.eth or the equivalent through the subdomain resolution could be could change, which means that that's where we sort of have to apply some kind of logic. Um, that is specific for these mutable responses. The challenge is that we don't really have immediate access to the TTL header, uh, sorry, to the TTL value because verified fetch doesn't return it yet. So yeah. the question is, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I guess the question, so first of all, this whole uh, suggestion that you made about using basically two caches, one for mutable, one for immutable. It seems irrelevant because you're either in a, an or like the origin already defines whether everything is mutable or everything is immutable. Uh, when you deploy the service worker gateway on a service, uh, subdomain gateway, yes, but you could yeah. deploy it on a path one and then that becomes relevant. So is when you say when you deploy it on a path, is that relevant for the service worker gateway though? Sure, like we, you can use it uh, on uh, for, for serving like path resources or subdomain resources or even like the DNS link uh, gateway. But right now, uh, but right now, right now, now we are focusing. No, yeah, like right now we are focusing on the subdomain. Uh, I, that's like you know, do you have a single cache object or two? That's kind of like less relevant rather than detail, yeah. what's your like expiration uh, strategy. I think the most important one is to kind of like le leverage service worker to the point where once you got the payload, the, that thing will always load. So it's like a try cache and revalidate in the background. Uh, okay. I think that's the most, uh, optimal thing for, for the browser and, and like small websites. 
Um, the TTL, yeah, uh, the TTL in general is interesting because we have a TTL in uh, IPNS records and DNS uh, also has, uh, DNS link records uh, have them as well. And uh, the default is all over the place. Some services use one minute, some services use uh, five minutes, some services use one hour. Um, so in IPNS, we the spec suggests like using one hour, um, but in that's kind of like you will never uh, satisfy everyone's needs with some default. Like what default is the least annoying, right? So uh, that's why the, why the belief uh, of going with stale while revalidate uh, type of uh, cache here is that you always return a useful response and you don't slow down an asset or a page load by checking for an update. The yeah. more common- So basically uh, applying the philosophy of stale while revalidate also yeah. here. Try yeah, to return something useful as soon as possible and then do the checking in the background. Yeah, the common uh, feedback from users who don't uh, have insight into how many moving pieces are there is that like IPNS is slow, right? And that's because you cannot have cake and eat cake. Uh, you either, uh, you need to pick. And uh, TTL I think is a part cider. Of the problem there yeah. with IPNS though is that there's a lot of confusion between the lifetime and the TTL. Yeah, correct. Uh, so the like, lifetime is is just the name that we call it, but it's validity in the actual IPNS. Yeah, report. yeah. It's like when the signature, uh, up, uh, the, the time stamp, uh, time stamp until which the signature is valid. Uh, yeah. Um, TTL. I think TTL now is easier to understand if you say that this is like a analog to TTL from DNS records. But yeah, right. I I think uh, this is a good opportunity to like break the meme that IPNS is slow, uh, while also giving people uh, something that works in offline mode. So if we are actually thinking about this a bit more holistically. Uh... Do you, it's been a little, a minute since I looked at some of the, some guy work on setting the cache headers um, for IPNS records, but from what I've noticed, it's, uh, I mean, like resolving IPNS records can take something like 10 seconds in some instances when using the delegated routing endpoint. And that's obviously something where we can heavily leverage uh, the, the HTTP cache headers. Um, I know there's like this sort of, again, it's- I mean, kind of, kind if Tim Take is, how long it takes is just more games of people playing with lifetime versus TTL. If you respond, if you just want to wait for a single record that is valid to come back, it's it takes shorter. If you're waiting for, to query more locations, to have greater confidence that this is the latest record, then it takes longer. So some of this may be like, it needs to be better. It's no, the delegated routing endpoints don't expose asynchronicity here because it was sort of like, okay, we'll, we'll see as it's needed, but, um, it, it's just, a, it's a matter of like, yeah, w one record, more records. How long do you want to try? Right. Um, before you give up, it's very reasonable to say that actually for a given application, just give me like the the latest valid record and I'll I'll manipulate the the lifetimes to be short enough that this isn't going to be a problem. Yeah, because yeah, you the, do have on... that natural problem arising if you have like say a five minute TTL but a lifetime say one hour, then in that whole time window there could be new records and then it's like what heuristics you apply in whatever resolution code you're implementing, whether that's in some guy or Kubo. Yeah, or, or you have others where, you know, who've decided that they want to set their lifetime in like the months to year range. Yeah. I right. guess the question there is like, what are the current defaults that we have in place in Kubo or in Boxer really? For I think the records, defaults are or... like a are like a day or something or like a day or two for a lifetime something maybe but i know that there I are did. groups like like i remember when web3 storage did the w3 name thing i think they were setting it at like a year as the lifetime 
yeah default. i think like ipns record expiration by default matches the uh expiration interval on the amino dht which is 48 hours right now so effectively I, you you could have a record which is valid for a year, but effectively DHT will forget it after 48 hours anyway. So it's more makes more sense to have a default which matches that. Um, if you use something like pops up uh, IPNS over pops up, uh, then you are no longer uh, beholden to to that. But it's safer to go with that default, and the default TTL is one hour, at least like in Box or Kubo. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. I've just jotted it down. Um, I think I'll be doing a little bit more of end to end testing, um, and just see how like it, it's working practically with all of these caches, because there's also a little bit of a, I think there's caching in place inside Helia, um, for IPNS records, which, uh, um, I guess depending on the data store you have will be relevant if you're using IndexedDB. If we do reintroduce IndexedDB, um, then, I mean, that'll be a good place to, like a second layer cache if if the cache API um, doesn't uh, hit. Yeah, yeah. Effectively, like the, the good way of thinking about TTL is like it informs the expiration of any cache you have. It could be HTTP, it could be DNS, it could be inside of namesis when you resolve IPNS name to a, from mutable to immutable pointer for how long you reuse already resolved and cached uh, pointer before you check the network. So that's like, you know, uh, if you see that, oh, IPNS does not get updated for one hour, that's because it's got cached, uh, it's read from cache for one hour and only after that it gets uh, checked again. Um, and that's tricky from the perspective of something like Service Worker Gateway in that the publisher of the record controls DTL, just like publisher of the website controls the DTL. But then maybe, you know, uh, the website owners, do they think about the DTL of their record? Well, not really, because they just point at the HTTP server and the, the updates happen on the server. But when we now use the a TTL as a knob for controlling how often uh, the updates or how fast the updates get populated uh, across the centralized system, all the, the gateways where you don't you don't publish the ga gateway. The gateway makes their, their own decision for how long they cache. Um, it, it gets tricky, and that, that's why I think like defaulting to the stale while revalidate is good compromise between end user cutting down the number of milliseconds. Uh, until they see the page load and also getting the latest uh, update. Yeah, and, and your recommendation there was an hour, which sort of uh, had me thinking it's not a big deal because if it is one hour and we're doing the revalidation, like as the request comes in, then yeah. that one hour isn't critical because during that, immediately after that request goes the cache like a stale cache response returns, then you're just checking and updating in the background. So it's not a big deal. Yeah. It's also like, you know, just a function of uh, just landing the cache is better. It does not have to be perfect. Landing the, that is better. I assume that uh, while like getting the TTL back, I require you to do additional lookup or updating some APIs to also return you TTL. I don't know if you uh, get TTL from the DNS link and IPNS resolution. We had that problem on the Go side uh, and had to be refactored. Some interfaces had to be updated to include. So TTL. in this case, the main interface we're dealing with is verified fetch and verified fetch. If it adheres to the spec properly and I've opened an, an issue about the cache control not being set, but if it is being set, then we will be able to derive it, I suppose, from the cache control header, like the yeah, main stage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we probably don't Which want to invent any new headers, just use what, exactly. uh, what exists, yeah. And right now, I mean, one of the challenges we face is that uh, because we don't have it and uh, say there's mutable requests coming in because there's an immutable header set on them, like the, basically there's a cache control being wrongly set as immutable for IPNS resources. That's the bug that will be fixed once they're set properly in verified fetch. 
because of that, um, we saw, uh, I think we might have problems with the HTTP cache, which happens if you don't intercept a request or you don't respond from um, the cache API. Uh, the critical thing is that um, in order to know when we set the cache, we actually need to set a custom header. And I know you suggested expires. It feels really hacky to do this, but for now, that's the only way for me to know when I actually set a response in the cache API of the service worker. So I'm basically setting an expires header and then checking the value in it to see. Um, and, and I'm basically sort of breaking out of HTTP semantics, which say that cache control and max H takes precedence over the uh, expires header. Yeah, but, but we also uh, remember that we are in a service worker context, which ignores uh, the cache yeah. control. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so it's, it's kind of like, like uh, yeah, yeah. Just yellow it. Um, all right. Um, uh, is there anything else you want to discuss? I don't know. I feel, I, I don't know if there's much value in discussing anything here, uh, in this issue or some of the sub items without Russell, uh, being around just because he's pushing uh, on a lot of these fronts and, um, and I don't maybe just, to just a one way, maybe just a, a brief call out that like the, the thing is like lar largely functional now, even if there's like a lot of to be done which means that if people want to play around with it and and then sort of file issues then then they can uh and we can figure out sort of what's the right thing here now some of these like because some of the ux questions are are like maybe not obvious uh or as in like there's not only one way to answer them um and so yeah seeing uh what people's like feedback is um on various issues, on various things here when they try and loading it would be great. My feedback right now is for some reason, the base infrastructure underneath this seems to not be going very quickly, uh, which isn't even the page itself, which is sad. So we should go fix that. Um, yeah, that was the but, issue that we discussed yeah. yesterday, right? Um, yeah. I think the collab so. cluster and the publishing. Yes, yes. Yeah, so it's an 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 infra an infra bug over here that we should get fixed up uh soon so we can let people play around with this more easily. Yeah, it's a shame because it really does make a difference. I mean, just being able to load and, and have it then cached locally so that you can just I mean it makes every DAP that doesn't need like network activity in order to like function, it essentially makes it local first. Um by default, which is pretty amazing. Um, and you don't need to run an actual IPFS node. So I, I think that's something that we under uh, stress at this point, but I think we could definitely lean more heavily into that um, feature, which uh, is pretty neat. Um, okay. Um, which I guess is a good, it's a good moment now to talk about anything that we have going on in verified fetch. Um, I think the main thing is uh, the HTTP range header. Um, but again, I don't think there's anything in particular that needs to be discussed here. Uh, yeah, I guess the other thing is that we now are working on, so <laughs> basically moving DNS resolvers up to the root Helia object. This was something that we had in verified fetch. You could pass it as a second option. Um, but because we need DNS resolution in uh, other places inside Helia, I think it's related to the multi-adders. Um, it's basically uh, being moved up as a top level um, object. And you can take a look at this issue if you're interested in the details of that. Uh, DNS over, well, it's really DNS over HTTPS in Helia. So 
Initially, this was a Helia verified fetch option, but now it's moving to the root Helia object. Okay. This is it in terms of the agenda that we had planned. I think now is a good open to open up a discussion if there's anything else that folks want to discuss. I see there's uh, some uh, faces that we haven't seen here in a while. Dietrich, it's nice to see you, to at least uh, see your name. But also Derek Hammer and TJ, um, if you have anything you want to discuss, this is a good moment. Not just excited, but all at the same. It, it, just Go excited to, to listen to uh, what's going on here. All this is um, really exciting. Uh, you know, I've been waiting for years for this tech to become mature enough so we could run. Uh, you know. Uh, whole nodes in the browser and through service workers. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. You know, it's good stuff. If there's anything I can help on, I will try to chime in with the issues and see, see what I can do. But it uh, seems like everything's pretty well in hand. Yeah, uh, that's great. Thanks for sharing. Uh, oh, okay. And in browser is resolved now. So yeah, I just wanted to, use the opportunity to just give a quick demo. So uh, Vitalik ETH, I'm basically trying to load Vitalik's uh, website that typically, you know, if it's a dot that has a, a um, that has a DNS, uh, sorry, a SID set in the contact, content hash, either a SID or an IPNS name, then you can typically load it via ETH.limo. Um, or another one is eth.link, which is operated by uh, Cloudflare. Um, huh, I'm not sure why in-browser link isn't working, but I'm pretty sure it's just the infrastructure there. Um, if I load it on yeah. my local oh, well. one, uh, I'll, I'll call. Okay, is my... No, I wonder if we have some uh, some some errors changing from last time. I was walking around Denver last week, showing everybody the thing working on my phone. I was I was like, "Wait, it works!" And also, it somehow works on a phone, uh, and and that was that was pretty cool. But uh, so and, and just, I guess rapid to... rapid development here, rapid development. No, no, here. just to be very clear, <laughs> we literally may rename the name of the service worker yesterday. So now it does not work because it bypasses the caching that we've set up to protect from this very problem. <laughs> so it's like extremely the typical demo gods uh, curse uh, in that <laughs> we changed something that was working for a month and now it does not work. But yeah. OK. Demos will uh, improve. Rest assured, this is only the ninth meeting, and uh, it was a pretty ambitious goal. And I think I think we've come a pretty like we've come pretty far for what we've set out to do this quarter. So stay tuned, and some cool stuff will be coming. I think this is a good moment to end, unless we want to discuss anything else. Add one quick question: Does this architecture also mean that you'll be able to publish to the DHT and and publish IPNS names from the service worker? Uh, probably not. Um, okay. That's like the TLDR version. Uh, I think there's obviously more nuance there. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's um. So publishing from browsers with, so this is um. I say that the service worker fetching thing is basically let's call it the there's like there's three jobs an IPFS node does, which is it, it finds the data, fetches the data, and and validates or renders it. Um, so basically it used to be you have one node that either you either like say run a Kubo node that does all three jobs, or you have somebody else run a node that does all three jobs. Uh, and so now we're sort of like teasing the pieces apart and letting you do more and more of them client side. So step one here is that some someone else, like a, a gateway does find and fetch and you do validate. And the next plan is to sort of move more of that 
browser side. So you can do fetching and someone else's finding. Eventually you do find and fetch and also validate in the browser uh, if you want. Um, advertising and serving is uh, slightly different. The um, main limitations there at the moment are that the two most commonly used uh, advertising systems, which are the Amino DHT and IPNI, are not currently well suited for something is going to probably mess with my audio in a second. Ooh, the tension. No, you're a bit choppy. How about now? How about now? Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, cool. Yeah, Zoom. Um, Anyhow, uh, yeah, so the, those two systems are not well suited for browser interactions right now. Um, the DHT, both because of sort of uh, connection limits in browsers, but also connection types. Um, the Amino DHT doesn't have quite as many nodes supporting web, RT web transport uh, as would be good here, but also Chromium has web transport bugs, although Firefox nightly is coming along very nicely. Um, so, so I think like that's, that's sort of the, the issue there, but, um, and IP and I would work, although it's, uh, it's not, it's not really designed as it is right now for, uh, nodes that are for serving nodes that are short lived. Right. Um, so I think setting up, be, we should be able to reuse and set up some infrastructure around that, that makes that easier. But I think right now the focus is on the fetch side of things rather than the serving from the browsers. Yeah, it makes uh, sense. That being said, because the, so, so many of the pieces are basically there and that we're getting towards the, as we do the fetch side, that will make the transports and then moving the bytes into the browser easier. Um, and then you'll mostly just be left with the advertising side from the browser that's missing. So if there are people who are sort of interested in, in that side of in that side of the world, then then we should chat about like what are some good ways to make progress with the existing systems or or build other ones that would that are like good supplementary, like well they you know, an advertising system that makes sense for data that's very short lived. Well, my, excuse me, my uh, use case that I'm really interested in is uh, more decentralized writing to IPNI, where maybe you sign an uh, IPNS record in your local node and then propagate that record. Maybe you have an account with pinata or whoever is your hosting provider and they see that there's a record that you've signed and then they will continue to propagate that and keep your content pinned on their store and i've realized that separating the serving from the content discovery pieces of it but it in my mind it kind of helps decentralize it a little bit more so i don't have to have this other account and they're doing it all for me you know i could sign into the browser using my own private key and then generate these records, broadcast them. They, you know, I might have subscriptions in 10 different services and be like, hey, I want tjcorey.eth to point to this CID and I'm gonna host it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where I host it. It's none of your business. So um, anyway. It's that's some, that's yeah. easier, I think, in some ways, because yeah. um, uh, the data you're publishing is still correct even once your browser tab is closed yeah and right now there's no mechanism in the protocol for that kind of signaling which is you know it, it, and i get that it's an application layer thing and and it's probably you can make the argument that it's better left to the application layer on whatever service provider is but it'd be nice for there to be some sort of something built into the protocol um you you're talking about something put in, in into the protocol for being able to follow to basically to be able to follow mutable names for pinning. Yeah, or basically for lack of a better way to put it, pin a 
you know, I, IPNS uh, uh, record. So you basically say if, if a record signed by this, you know, peer ID shows up anywhere um, in the advertisement, then I am going to pin that and I'm going to repropagate it until I'm told to stop. Um, I don't know if I'm saying that clearly. No, no, enough. that makes a lot of sense. That, that that totally makes sense. I mean, interestingly, the delegated routing API already specifies how you would do that um, in terms of like an IPNS put um, HTTP request where you just essentially pass the uh, IPNS record. As for the actual implementation of this, I believe some guy, does some guy actually implement this? It does. Okay. So in theory, you could build a service using this API and some guy, okay. um, and then have some guy essentially published to the DHT for you. Great. Yeah. I just found it. I didn't even know this existed. Thank you. Yeah. Just a note. I've added that to the meeting notes. I hope in the right place. No, in the wrong place. <laughs> Um, I'll move it down. Um, we, the routing v1 HTTP API is exactly for like the, this purpose, like delegating, uh, all three types of routing we have content peers and IPNS, uh, to some third party. And that it, uh, does not tell what that third party will do with that record. Could be, it only stores it in a local database. And if someone asks, you know, get and post like a BitTorrent tracker and for some use cases, that's enough. Uh, but it could also like reprovide to other systems, right? It could, we could have a, a way of having a, a, the Amino DHT accept the signatures introduced uh, in, um, in, in the IP 379, uh, which I linked in the notes. Um, but if you want to self-host an endpoint uh, with a local kind of like additional routing system, like build your own routing system using this, uh, you could do that today. Uh, the on the uh, IPNS is easy because we already have specification how record looks like. You don't need to invent anything new. When it comes to uh, content, uh, provider records and peer records, uh, there, and if you if you don't want to trust the endpoint, you need to introduce some signatures. And there's a signature scheme based on CBOR, which is similar to what we have in IPNS uh, in that IPIP. So I believe there's a pull request with implementation of this uh, IPIP, like a reference implementation, but I don't believe the latest version of a, like a Docker image of some guy includes it yet. So, because it's like too fresh. So- Yeah, you know, I could- um... I was trying to find the Go version of it. It looks like it's part of core delegator. I'll, I'll do some more research. I appreciate you guys pointing me in the right direction. Yeah, there's a the Docker. I think the fastest way is to try Docker image. And you can like configure it through uh, environment variables. Uh, you can also use the it, like, make it uh, talk to other endpoints so you can scale your infrastructure that way. You don't have to have everything in one place. All right. Uh, with that, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. And we'll see you here in two weeks.